Hi friends, my name is Benjamin, and today I want to tell you another chilling story. Sydney Irene Loof was born on August 21, 1993, in Broken Bow, Nebraska. Raised in Arcadia by her parents George W. and Susie Loof, Sydney and her family relocated to Neelai around 2000. She was recognized for her adeptness in fishing. Although she participated in basketball and golf during her school years, her involvement in sports was curtailed due to scoliosis, which she developed as a teenager. Following her graduation from Neelai Oakdale High School in 2011, she found employment at a nearby Menard store. On November 16, 2017, a Thursday, Sydney Loof, age 24, was expected to work at Menards in Lincoln, Nebraska, where she served as a cashier. However, she didn't appear for her shift and failed to inform anyone of her absence. Concerned, her co-workers, friends, and family attempted to reach out to her via calls and texts, but received no response. Sydney's family relocated to Neelai when she was in second grade. Her mother, Susie, worked as a special education teacher, while her father, George, served as a school principal. They maintained a close-knit bond and even after Sydney moved from Menards in Norfolk to the Lincoln branch, they made efforts to keep in touch regularly, often meeting for dinner. Sydney frequently visited home, including a trip on the weekend of November 10th, when Susie accompanied her back to Lincoln after dinner. Sydney had been grappling with depression and found her medication ineffective, prompting her to seek help from a new doctor who prescribed different medication. Throughout the week of November 13th, Susie noted an improvement in Sydney's mood as she expressed a desire for change, including searching for a new job. Nevertheless, when Sydney didn't show up for work and her colleagues alerted her family, concerns mounted despite Sydney's recent positive demeanor. Sydney's parents visited her duplex apartment, only to find Sydney absent but her beloved cat, Mimsy, still present. This immediately heightened Susie's concern as she knew Sydney wouldn't leave her cat alone for an extended period without food or water. Fearing the worst, they reported Sydney missing to the police. Prior to this, the police had conducted a welfare check on Sydney at the request of her colleagues. Although nothing seemed amiss inside the apartment, apart from the absence of water for Mimsy, the locked state of the apartment and Sydney's parked car outside suggested she hadn't simply stepped out briefly. Despite no apparent signs of foul play, Sydney's family remained convinced that something was wrong, and the police took their concerns seriously. Susie informed the police that she suspected her daughter had gone on a date on the evening of November 15th. She provided a screenshot of Sydney's Snapchat post featuring a photo of herself with the caption, Ready for my date. Sydney's friends corroborated this confirming that she had plans to meet up with a woman named Audrey, whom she had connected with on Tinder. Upon scrutinizing Sydney's phone records and surveillance footage from her workplace, the authorities identified a person they urgently needed to speak with. Sydney's phone had last pinged a cell tower in the Wilbur area, close to an apartment occupied by a woman named Bailey Boswell. Investigators believed that 26-year-old Bailey was the individual Sydney had met on the night of November 15th, using the name Audrey Online. When contacted by the police, Bailey claimed that she and Sydney had been on two dates, with the second occurring on the night of November 15th, the evening before Sydney was reported missing. Bailey stated that she hadn't heard from Sydney since then and didn't know her whereabouts. The police intended to pursue further discussions with Bailey but before they could do so, she fled with her 52-year-old boyfriend, Aubrey Trail. While evading authorities, Bailey and her boyfriend, Aubrey Trail, took to Facebook to post videos asserting their innocence regarding Sydney's disappearance and expressing hope for her safe return. Bailey claimed to have been on two dates with Sydney, stating that she had dropped her off at a friend's house and hadn't heard from her since. In one video, she apologized to Sydney's family, denying any involvement in her disappearance and expressing her wish for Sydney's swift recovery, describing her as a wonderful person. After several days of pursuit, the police eventually located Bailey and Aubrey Trail in a hotel in Branson, Missouri. 
Despite their attempts to evade capture, law enforcement successfully apprehended them. Tragically, weeks after Sydney was reported missing, extensive analysis of Bailey's phone and location records led the police to discover Sydney's remains. Shockingly, her body had been dismembered, with her remains divided into 14 parts and placed in black plastic garbage bags scattered in ditches across Clay County. Notably, some of Sydney's organs, including her heart, were missing. Bailey and Aubrey faced charges of first-degree murder, improper disposal of human remains, and conspiracy to commit murder. While Bailey pleaded not guilty to all three charges, Aubrey pleaded not guilty to murder and conspiracy, but admitted guilt to improper disposal of human remains. Despite being ordered to undergo separate trials, the prosecution presented essentially identical cases against both Bailey and Aubrey. The trials were held in Lexington, as the defense argued that the extensive publicity surrounding the case would prevent a fair trial in Wilbur. The prosecution asserted that Sidney was murdered through strangulation in a premeditated attack meticulously planned by both Aubrey and Bailey to fulfill a depraved sexual fantasy. They contended that Aubrey and Bailey were leaders of a group seeking to recruit young women for sexual activities, with Bailey utilizing Tinder to find potential victims. Evidence presented to the jury indicated that Bailey initiated contact with Sydney via Tinder, leading to a date where they drove around, conversed, and consumed alcohol and prohibited substance. Bailey then arranged to meet Sydney again on the night of November 15th, a request which Sydney accepted. Bailey brought Sydney to their basement apartment in Wilbur, shared with Aubrey. According to the prosecution, upon Sydney's arrival, Bailey and Aubrey immediately attacked her, strangling her with an extension cord on the living room floor. They alleged that Sydney was killed within 24 minutes of entering the apartment. Following the murder, Bailey and Aubrey meticulously cleaned the apartment, a part of their premeditated plan, argued the prosecution. They then proceeded to dismember Sydney and dispose of her remains in Clay County the following day, November 16th. Surveillance footage presented to the jury depicted Bailey and Aubrey purchasing tools for dismemberment and cleaning supplies on November 15th, mere hours before Sydney's murder. Testimony from their landlord, Jennifer Cole, revealed that on November 16th, upon entering the house, she detected the strong odor of bleach and Clorox, indicating extensive cleaning had taken place. Sydney's death was determined to be a homicide caused by strangulation, as revealed by the autopsy conducted on the 13 recovered body parts. The examination indicated abrasions on Sydney's wrists, a head injury, torn earlobes, as well as abrasions and bruises on her back. Defensive wounds suggested Sydney had fought for her life. Dr. Michelle Alif, a forensic pathologist, testified in court that Sydney's cause of death was homicide by strangulation. Toxicology reports revealed the presence of antidepressant medication in Sydney's system. Additionally, it was noted during the proceedings that apart from the missing organs, the part of Sydney's body not recovered was her upper left arm, specifically the area above the elbow and below the shoulder. During Aubrey's trial, he erupted in an outburst, vehemently proclaiming Bailey's innocence in Sydney's death. Bailey is innocent. Curse you all. He then proceeded to inflict self-harm by slashing his throat three times with a razor blade. Following this incident, Aubrey did not attend the trial for a couple of weeks. When he finally reappeared in the courtroom during the defense stage, only to testify, he was wheeled in and remarked to the judge with a smirk, I'm going to be good. It's uncommon for an accused individual to testify at their own trial due to the risks involved, such as revealing too much information, struggling to answer questions effectively, or displaying hostility towards questioning attorneys, which could impact the jury's perception unfavorably. However, in Aubrey's case, his decision to testify wasn't as unusual due to his extensive prior interactions with the police after his arrest. During initial police interviews following his arrest, Aubrey provided a bizarre narrative involving a purported sex cult he and Bailey were supposedly part of. He spoke of involvement in witchcraft, claimed to be a vampire capable of flight, 
and portrayed himself as the leader of a sexual cult with witches among its members. According to Aubrey's initial account, the witches would supposedly gain power through torturing and killing other women. Regarding Sidney's death, Aubrey claimed to have paid her dollar 5,000 to participate in a sexual fantasy with two other women. He asserted that Sidney's death occurred accidentally during the consensual sexual activity and admitted to disposing of her body. Aubrey further stated to the police that he dismembered Sidney's body as part of a ritual aligned with his religious beliefs. He claimed to have drained her blood to release her soul to the gods in a sacred location and arranged her body parts to expedite her reincarnation process. During Aubrey's testimony, he informed the jury that he and Bailey initially encountered Sidney in March 2017 and paid her to participate in their illicit activities due to her financial needs. He claimed they lost contact afterward, but in November 2017, Bailey sought to reignite their relationship and reached out to Sidney again. Aubrey asserted that Sidney, in need of money, agreed to meet him on November 15th, which is why he was at Menards that day. Aubrey claimed to have offered Sidney $5,000 to join their antique theft operation. Later that evening, the three of them engaged in sexual activities during which Sidney was accidentally asphyxiated with an extension cord they were using in a sexual game. Aubrey stated, I don't know if Sidney had a seizure or what, but that's when she stopped breathing. He informed the court that there was no ceremonial aspect to the dismemberment of Sidney's body, dismissing any notions of witchcraft, vampires, or blood draining as untrue. He explained that he resorted to dismembering her because her body wouldn't fit in the car. When questioned about the tool he used, he described it as a curved saw akin to a hacksaw blade. Aubrey admitted to feeling panicked and subsequently disposed of her remains in a Clay County field at daybreak on November 16th. He justified his failure to seek assistance by expressing doubt that anyone would believe his account of accidental death. Aubrey acknowledged disposing of Sidney's body, but maintained that her demise occurred accidentally during sexual activity involving an extension cord. During Bailey's trial, she vehemently denied any involvement in the events. Instead, her legal team argued that she herself was a victim of Aubrey's actions. They portrayed her as a vulnerable young woman when she met Aubrey, emphasizing her isolated living situation and recent escape from an abusive relationship with her child's father while working as a waitress in Princeton, Missouri. The defense firmly asserted that Bailey played no part in Sidney's death or the disposal of her body. However, the prosecution countered this claim, presenting evidence that contradicted Bailey's innocence. They highlighted the proximity of a cell phone linked to Bailey's Tinder account to the location where Sidney's remains were discovered. Detailed analysis of Bailey's phone and location records ultimately aided law enforcement in locating Sidney's remains. The court also learned that it was Bailey who initiated contact with Sidney and arranged their meeting. She was the one who arrived at Sidney's duplex to pick her up on the evening of November 15th. Testimony from three other women who had been in relationships at different times with Aubrey and Bailey, all originating from Tinder, was presented to the jury. They testified that Bailey had contacted them on Tinder, engaging in sexual activities with both Bailey and Aubrey. One woman stated that she even traveled with them after their Tinder encounter. She claimed that Aubrey provided her with a $1.200 weekly allowance and invited her to join what he referred to as his cult. He described members of the group as witches and informed her that to join, she would need to participate in acts of torture and murder. He even suggested potential victims, including a woman they had met through Tinder. According to her testimony, Bailey was referred to as the Queen Witch within the group. Another woman provided testimony stating that Bailey frequently discussed her desire to break fingers and her fascination with dismembering bodies, expressing enjoyment in conversations about torture. All three women who testified emphasized that both Bailey and Aubrey actively engaged in discussions regarding torture and murder. Furthermore, the court was informed that Bailey was in Aubrey's company on the day Sidney was killed, 
during which they purchased tools such as a hacksaw, tin snips, and a utility knife from Home Depot together. Around noon that day, Bailey sent Sydney a text message inquiring about her day. Phone records and security footage confirmed that Bailey was in the Menards parking lot with Aubrey at the time she sent the Tinder message. Despite Sydney's employment at Menards, there was no indication that she was aware of Bailey's presence there. A few hours later, Bailey sent Sydney another Tinder message, informing her that she was at her apartment to pick her up. Despite Sydney's expectation of driving around on their date, phone records suggest that they instead went to the apartment where Bailey and Aubrey resided. Bailey's attorney contended that the evidence regarding Bailey indicated her involvement in purchasing bleach and trash bags for Aubrey's use in disposing of Sydney's body, potentially making her culpable for aiding and abetting in the improper disposal of human remains. However, he urged the jury to consider whether this evidence was sufficient to establish aiding and abetting first-degree murder or conspiracy to commit murder. He implored the jury to concentrate solely on the evidence presented and not to be swayed by the graphic autopsy photos. The jury deliberated for only a few hours before reaching a decision to convict Aubrey Trail of first-degree murder, conspiracy to commit murder, and improper disposal of human skeletal remains. Trail requested a new trial, which was denied by judge. Bailey Boswell, on the other hand, succeeded in her motion to change the venue, citing prejudice, and it was granted. However, in February 2020, district judge recused herself from the case due to her involvement in Nebraska's execution protocol implementation. In October 2020, a jury found Bailey Boswell guilty of first-degree murder, conspiracy to commit murder, and improper disposal of human remains. Then, in June 2021, a three-judge panel unanimously decided to sentence Aubrey Trail to death. Trail attempted to represent himself in the appeal process, but his request was rejected. Meanwhile, Boswell received a life sentence after one of the three judges stated that her actions did not meet the threshold of exceptional depravity required for imposing the death penalty. What do you think of today's story? Write your opinion about this case in the comments. I thank you for your attention and recommend subscribing to the channel, as well as clicking on the bell to not miss new videos that are released daily. Take care of yourself and your loved ones. See you soon.